Hi, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Portola Redwood State Park. My name is Michelle Garcia, and I am coming to you from Portola. I am an interpreter here at Portola Redwood State Park, which means that I help interpret the language of science and nature and turn it into a language that is fun and easy for everyone to understand. Now, speaking of everyone, I'm gonna check and see how many people we got tuning in here today. All right, looks like we got five awesome people tuning in this morning. More may come, but I'm gonna count on you five and all of our participants to help answer some questions. Now, we're gonna practice this for our Junior Ranger program. You guys should have the ability to uh, like press the raise your hand button. So we're gonna practice this. I want all of you guys to raise your hand if you have used water today. Go ahead and press that raise hand button. Nice, you guys did it, all right. Now, you guys are gonna try to type, practice typing in the Q&A section. I want you guys to type where you guys are watching from today. I want you guys to type where you are watching from today. I'll give you a little shout out. Oh, hi, Tom and Ryan from London. Oh my gosh, London, England. Wow, you guys are so far away. That's so cool. And from Ben Lomond. Oh, we've got a local too. From Newman, California. Nice. That's so cool, you guys. You're from our, you guys are from all over the place. Uh, I'm originally from San Diego, California, but I'm definitely happy you guys are here today to talk about some of the curious creeks we have here at Portola. Now, there are a, there's a lot of water on Earth. There is, in fact, roughly 326 million trillion gallons of water on Earth. I know this is probably backwards for you guys, but there are 18 zeros in this number. There are 18 zeros. That is a lot of water. That is roughly the same amount as 1,260 million trillion liters or 1,000 million trillion liters of water. So of these water bottles, that's a lot of water on earth. But we can't use all of that water. We can't use most of that water, actually. About 97% of that water is in the ocean. It's full of salt, and we can't drink that. Another 2% of that water is frozen in glacial ice caps and the very north and south poles of the Earth. That leaves 1%. 1% of the water on Earth is fresh water that we could technically drink. But we can't even drink all of that water because a lot of that water is too polluted and too remote for us to access. So that leaves less than 1% of that water that we can actually drink and use. So I want you guys to go back in your memory this morning and think about all of the times that you used water today. Maybe you got up this morning and you went to the bathroom and you flushed the toilet. That's like a few gallons of water. Maybe you brushed your teeth this morning. That might be half a liter of water. Maybe you drank some water this morning because you were thirsty. Maybe you had milk in your cereal or you drank some orange juice. That all has water in it. Maybe you guys even did laundry today. That took water to wash your clothes. Or maybe some of your grown-ups made a cup of coffee this morning. Making a cup of coffee takes a lot more water than you think it does. And that's only what you've used this morning. Could you imagine how much water you've used this week or this month or over the span of your entire life? We have to share that less than 1% of water with everyone on Earth who uses it every day. But not only do all the people on Earth share that less than 1% of water, but all of the plants and animals do too. If the water is too polluted or too remote for us to access, it's too polluted and too remote for the plants and animals to access as well. So <laughs> water is kind of an endangered species. 
Luckily, there's still a lot of water on Earth, and we do have a lot of it to share and spread around. But we definitely need to be conscious and wise about the water that we use, because we do share it with all of the creatures. Today, for our Junior Ranger program, we are going to check out some of the fresh water that runs right here through Portola Redwood State Park. And we're going to take a look at some of the creatures that we share this water with. And we're going to talk about what happens when that water gets polluted and what happens to those animals when that water gets polluted and all kinds of other cool things. Remember, if you guys tune in and watch this entire program all the way through, you get to earn not only a virtual stamp, but if you watch multiple Junior Ranger programs, you can earn real prizes. Real prizes such as a lovely Junior Ranger badge, which I'm sporting right now, or some cool patches to wear, and even a real certificate that makes you an official Junior Ranger. So tune in and also watch other Junior Ranger programs so you can earn real prizes. So at Portola, we have two major streams that rush through our park. It's Pescadero and Peters Creek. I'm gonna check the Q&A. <laughs> oh, thanks, I appreciate that. Someone said they like my necklace. That was nice of you to say. So we've got two major creeks running through Portola, Peters Creek and Pescadero Creek. Now, Portola is in a valley. So I want you guys all to put your hands in front of you like this. This is what a valley is. When there are two mountains, your hands are the mountains, and then your fingers down here, that's the valley. That means whenever it rains in the wintertime, all of the water comes rushing down off the mountains and into the valley. And that's what Portola is, in this little valley right here. So all of the water in the area comes rushing through Portola. Not only do we get all of our local water rushing through Portola, but Portola itself, this rainforest, gets 40 to 60 inches of water a year. That's right, that makes Portola a rainforest. Portola is a temperate rainforest that gets a ton of water a year, which means that our little creeks that are here in the summer are rushing rivers in the wintertime, which are full of all kinds of creatures that depend on this water. So it's really cool. If you guys have ever been here in the summertime, the creeks look completely different than in the wintertime. And there's a completely different set of animals that come out in the winter too. So if you've been to Portola during the summer, I definitely recommend you come during the winter too, because it is a wild rainforest out here. So let's take a look at some of the creatures that we have here at Portola. Now, a lot of the creatures that I'm going to be showing to you guys are macro invertebrates. Everyone say macro invertebrates. Nice, I heard you guys all the way from here at Portola, nice. And to tell us more about what a macro invertebrate is, I'm going to enlist a friend of mine, my friend, my friend, the banana slug. Now, banana slugs are actually a type of macro invertebrate. Everyone say, hi, banana slug. Look, he's kind of coming out and saying hi to you guys. There he is. Hi, buddy. You're doing so good. Now, a macro invertebrate is a type of creature that is visible to the eye, so it's big. Macro means big. And invertebrate means that they do not have a vertebrae or they do not have a spine. And as you guys can probably see, this banana slug is really squishy and does not have any kind of spine. I got a big one, see? Macro, big, visible to the eye, and invertebrate, no spine. So the, a lot of the animals that we're gonna be looking at today are macro invertebrates. They're visible to the eye and they don't have a spine. Some of them are really big and squishy, like the banana slug, uh, while others have other means of protecting themselves, like they might have a shell on top of them instead of a spine, or like lots of hard coverings all over their body or they live in a cocoon to help keep them safe. Now, for those of you who have ever held a banana slug, you know that it's kind of weird, but it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, whenever you handle a banana slug or any kind of macroinvertebrate, they're really sensitive to chemicals and pollution in the water. So you always wanna make sure that you've just recently washed your hands like I have. 
And specifically when touching banana slugs, you only want to touch the bottom of the banana slug because that's its thickest, strongest part. When you touch its outside yellow skin, that's where it's really sensitive. But the bottom of the banana slug is really, really strong. So see, I'm only touching the bottom of it, not touching any of the yellow part. All right, everyone say thanks, banana slug, for helping us learn about macroinvertebrates. You did a great job. Everyone say bye, banana slug. My hand is so gooey now. Oh my goodness. It's okay. It's nice and uh, it's nice and shiny. It's great. All right, so let's take a look at some of the other macroinvertebrates that we have in our crew. All right, I bought the first one already for you guys. I'm gonna take our little screen off. Ooh, we're going more mobile. And we're gonna flip the screen around. Tink. So our first invertebrate that we have here is mosquito larva. Everyone say mosquito larva. Let's see, will you focus, buddy? There you go. So mosquito larva, they're like baby mosquitoes. And that's what we have right in here, kind of hanging around. That's mosquito larva. Now, if you guys have ever been to Portola, you know the mosquitoes are not fun. They're kind of bite you and eat you. This is definitely my least favorite macroinvertebrate that we have hanging out today. But luckily, some of the other invertebrates I'm gonna show you guys will actually eat mosquito larva and actually help to kind of get rid of our mosquito population, which are kind of pests here. So once again, these are little baby mosquitoes, like little mosquito larva. One day they'll grow up and hatch and turn into real live big mosquitoes. That's your first macroinvertebrate. I'm gonna take a look at another one. Oh, by the way, I wanna add that all of these macroinvertebrates were very humanely found and treated. I actually got up really early this morning to go and look for these macroinvertebrates. So they haven't been in here very long, I promise. And once we're all done with them today, once they helped us learn all this great information, I'm going to return them back into the creek. Whenever you find or pick up any kind of creature, you always want to return it to the exact same place that you found it. All right. Our next one is a creature that you might not have heard of before. It's called a crane fly. Everyone say crane fly. Now, this isn't like a real crane fly, but it's a baby crane fly. Just how, like how we saw the mosquito larva. I'm gonna show you guys the crane fly larva right now. Let's take a look at it. Here we go, crane fly. There you go, do you guys see him swimming around? He's a little bit bigger than the mosquito larva. And he's gonna grow up to actually be a really pretty, really nice creature. With these big, beautiful wings, they kind of look like baby dragonflies when they're all grown up. But this is a little baby crane fly right now. Here, I'm gonna show you guys a picture of what the crane flies will look like when they're all grown up. Oh, just kidding. I don't have a picture of that one. But I'm gonna show you a picture of the next one when it's all grown up. All right, up next, we're gonna have a caddis fly. Everyone say caddis fly. Now, a caddis fly larva likes to hide in a cocoon. It'll actually collect a bunch of little tiny rocks and then glue them together all over itself. So hopefully our caddis fly will kind of poke its head out so you can, guys can see it. It kind of looks like a little spider, but it's gonna be covered in all these little rocks. Here we go. All right. Here is our caddis fly. Those are the rocks that I was telling you guys about. And let's see if maybe he'll come out to show us what he really looks like. Come on, buddy. You just want to see what you look like, okay? Oh. There he is. Do you guys see his little legs coming out? Mm 
There we go. It's kind of coming out a little bit. Not a ton, though. And that's okay. He's kind of shy. Now I'm going to show you guys a picture. This is kind of an example of some of the caddisfly casings and the rocks that they hide themselves in. And this is what it looks like when they're all grown up. They've got these big, long antennas and these big, long wings to help them fly around. They're also kind of like a dragonfly, and they'll kind of buzz around and lay their eggs in the water. Let's see. I think he's come out a little bit more now. There he is. Nicely done. Our caddisfly is feeling a little shy. That's okay. Our macaron vertebrates only get bigger from here. We also, this is my favorite one that I'm gonna show you guys. We have mayflies. Everyone say mayfly. Now, this is a mayfly nymph. A mayfly nymph, just kind of like we saw earlier, is a like little baby mayfly. And mayflies will grow up to be these really big, beautiful things, just like dragonflies. Here we go, some mayfly nymphs. Switch. All right, do you guys see those little critters with the three long tails and the six legs? That is a mayfly or a mayfly nymph. These guys are really cool because they actually have exterior gills. Oh, hi, buddy. I know you're moving a lot. If you guys can see these little lines coming off the ends of their body, those are their exterior gills. That's how they breathe. And they have these big eyes at the top of their head and these three really distinctive tails. One of them doesn't have its tails, which is really sad. But I, uh, I stole it from a little critter that was trying to eat it. So I think I saved its life, I hope. Here's a bigger picture of what mayflies look like. Mayfly nymph. And this is what the adult mayflies look like. I think they look a little weird and creepy, but that is okay. I kind of like the way they look when they're little baby nymph mayflies. Look at them. They're so cute. Kink. You guys got a nice view of our visitor center. All right, now the next two critters I'm gonna show you guys are kind of bigger. And so I was too afraid to catch them while they're alive, but I was lucky enough to find the casings of them so that you guys can get an up close look at what they are. Now this guy is a little stonefly. Stoneflies, once they get old enough, will actually form a hard shell around them so that they can break out of the casing. Stonefly nymphs, just like we saw a mayfly nymph, this is a stonefly nymph, have these two long tails at the end. This guy's tails are kind of cut off. There we go, that's what he looks like. And they'll make these little casings around themselves. You can kind of see the opening of where this stonefly nymph escaped. Because in their casing, it's kind of like a butterfly when they're like a cocoon, they will break out and grow wings and get older and also start to fly around and start the next stage of their life. Here's a nice big picture of what a stonefly nymph looks like before it escaped, it's escaped its casing and what it looks like after. It kind of looks like a big beetle with wings. Now, you guys may be wondering, what the heck are all these words like nymph and larva? They kind of look weird, but she keeps calling them a fly. Now, just like butterflies undergo a metamorphosis, they change from adult to caterpillar to cocoon. So do all of these creatures that we're talking about today. And I've got some pictures to tell you guys about it. Now, just like yesterday, you probably learned with Martha about how butterflies undergo complete metamorphosis. This metamorphosis that they undergo has four stages. They're an adult butterfly flying around, which lays some eggs. Those, out of those eggs, hatch. Out of this egg, hatches larva or a caterpillar. That caterpillar turns into a pupa or a chrysalis. And then from that chrysalis emerges a butterfly. 
Now, these creatures undergo the same kind of thing. We have an adult dragonfly here. That adult dragonfly lays little eggs. And out of that egg hatches a nymph. Everyone say nymph. You guys might remember that we looked at mayfly nymphs and stonefly nymphs. So they're basically little baby versions of the adults. And eventually that nymph will grow up and emerge to be an adult mayfly, stonefly, or dragonfly. I unfortunately was not able to find any dragonfly nymphs because in this late summer season, all the dragonflies are laying their eggs. If you've ever seen a dragonfly flying across a still pool of water and then dipping its tail, it, tail in, that's the dragonfly laying its eggs. So we don't have any dragonfly nymphs quite yet. We only have adult dragonflies and their eggs. But soon the nymphs will emerge and dragonfly nymphs love to eat mosquito larva. So soon enough, we'll have some dragonfly nymphs eating that mosquito larva and the world will be just a little bit better. <laughs> now we don't just have macroinvertebrates here in our creeks. We have a lot of other creatures. Um, I kind of like checking out the macroinvertebrates because they're easy to find. At any time you can go to basically any creek and pick up a rock and find a macroinvertebrate kind of crawling around on the rock. They're just like little bugs that hang out in our creek. But we have some larger organisms that hang out in our creek as well. We also have crawdads. Now, this guy is not alive. I did not kill him, I promise. But I did find him a couple of days ago on the creek. Uh, he was not doing well when I found him. And as I passed by him a second time, he was not moving at all. So I decided to use him for our program that we had going. Now, the crawdads, we have a lot of crawdads in our creek and they can get big. I've seen them get to be about six or eight inches long. So this is kind of a smaller one. As you see, they've got these big claws for defending themselves. They're very territorial. And they've got this little mouth right in here. Da, 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 da. And these little claws that they can eat. Ooh. A lot of times crawdads or crayfish, or what they're also called, will dig into the algae that we have here in our creek with that little like, all that really like soft, squishy plant material and look for macroinvertebrates to eat. So crawdads actually go and eat all these little insects that we've been talking about today. Now, it's actually kind of a bummer because the crawdads we have here are invasive. Everyone say invasive. So an invasive species, or let's see, I want you guys to try to raise your hand if you know what an invasive species is. Raise your hand if you know what an invasive species is. Nice, okay, we've got a few people who know. All right, if you don't know what an invasive species is, an invasive species is a species that is not from the area and will take control of an area. So if you've ever been to the creeks here at Portola, you know that we have a ton of crawdads. They are everywhere in our creeks and that's not natural. The reason we have so many is because they have come and they've taken over this ecosystem and become one of our top predators, which is really sad because that, per that puts all of our macroinvertebrates and other animals that use our creek at risk. They can also put the people that hang out in our creeks at risk because they have these big claws that will pinch fingers and toes. We've never had a major injury due to crawdad, but I'm sure it's coming because we have a lot of people that hang out in our creeks and we also have a lot of crawdads. There are some native or some natural species of crawdad, but they are few and far between and none of them are supposed to be here at Portola. So the fact that we have so many crawdads here is not a good sign which is really sad because they're kind of cute and really cool to look at, but they're not good for our creeks here, which is really a bummer. Which is why I thought grabbing this guy from the creek wouldn't be too bad. But he's so cool. So if you guys ever come here to Portola, you guys can try to catch your own crawdad. 
uh, and no one will give you a hard time about it because you're actually making the park a little bit better if you try to catch some crawdads. Another organism we have in our creek, the largest organism we have in our creeks is very difficult to catch. They are only seasonal. They often come up the creek from the ocean in the winter time and lay their eggs in the spring. And so right now in the summer, we have a bunch of little baby ones swimming around, but I was able to find us a big one. This is trout. Now, this isn't a real trout. This is my friend, Buddy, Buddy the Trout. Uh, and he helps me with a lot of different programs we do here at Fort Pola. But Buddy is a very realistic depiction of what the trout in our creek look like. Our trout can become bigger than my arm. As you can see, Buddy is much bigger than my arm. In fact, I've seen trout in our creeks during the summer that are very, very big, even bigger than Buddy here. And that's because, like I said, during the winter time, all of our trout will swim upstream, up through our creeks, and lay their eggs here at Portola. But as summer comes and we have less water rushing through our creeks, some of the big trouts will get stuck in our pools of water, which is really sad because you just see them swimming in circles all summer long, and then eventually they don't make it, which is where the crawdads come in. The crawdads will often attack and try to eat dead or dying trout, which is really, really sad because this trout is a vital nutrient source for all of the other creatures here that live in our creeks, whether it's the bobcats, the coyotes, or the mountain lions, or the birds, but the crawdads almost always attack and get to them first. Boo, bad crawdad. But don't worry, Buddy the Trout here lives a very happy life free from crawdads, he's my good buddy. And we're definitely trying to be good to all of our creatures that live here at Portola. Not just the trout and even to the crawdads because they're still living things, but even to the macroinvertebrates. Now, one bummer thing, you know, I mentioned that you guys, to you guys that Portola is in a valley. It's at the bottom of a bunch of mountains. And we're gonna see what happens to a valley after it rains. Now, here I've got a piece of paper, or what seems to be a piece of paper, but this is actually going to be a mountain range. I'm going to show you how I'm going to turn this piece of paper into a mountain range. You're just going to crumple it up like this. This isn't a mountain range yet, but if you unfold it, you can kind of pretend that these are mountains. Do you see it? this mountain peak right here, and there's a mountain peak right here, and some more right here. And at the bottom of those mountains, you have a valley, just like I showed you guys earlier. I want you guys to imagine that these mountains are the Santa Cruz Mountains, and this valley is Portola. We're gonna go on an adventure through these mountains. And our tracks will be left behind by these markers. So say we go on a drive along the mountains above Portola. Um, but as we drive, we start to leak oil. So these marks are oil. As we drive, we start to leak oil. And then we get kind of hungry and we stop to get food. And then once we eat those food, we throw the trash out the window. We just throw the trash out the window. And then as we keep driving, we keep throwing trash out the window, keep leaking oil. Maybe someone needs to go to the bathroom. And so we stop and we go to the bathroom on the side of the road. All kinds of good stuff. And look at this mess that we made on these mountains. That's crazy. But that's okay because Portola's way down here. How is this mess we made up at the mountaintops gonna affect Portola? Well, I'll show you guys. because we may be driving along these mountains during the summertime, but eventually it's gonna rain. And it's gonna rain a lot because like I told you guys, we get 60 to 40 inches of rain a year, which means we are a rainforest. So we get a lot of rain. Do you guys see what's happening to all that pollution you left behind? 
It's going down and into Fortola, and it's just collecting there, and it's sitting there. Because all of the rain will wash all of that pollution out of the mountains and into the valleys like we have here at Fortola. I want you guys to raise your hand and tell me if you think all of that pollution that runs from the mountaintops and down into Portola when it rains has no effect on the animals that live in the creeks. Raise your hand if you think that all that pollution running into Portola has no effect on the animals in our creeks. All right, all right. Now I want you guys to raise your hand if you think that the pollution that runs into Portola does have an effect on the animals in our creeks. Yep, you guys are right. I'm gonna raise my hands too. That pollution is not good for the animals here in our creeks. Because actually a lot of the animals that live in our creek are very, very sensitive to pollution. These animals cannot exist if there are pollution in it. Animals like mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, and a lot of other organisms cannot tolerate pollution. Luckily, when I as I showed you today, we have a lot of mayflies here and a lot of stoneflies and a lot of caddisflies, which means that we don't have a lot of pollution in our creeks, which is awesome. But come winter time, that might change. We might get a lot of pollution that runs into our creeks, which is unfortunate. But luckily for you guys, you guys can actually help make a difference in that. If you guys are able to pick up trash that you leave behind, pick up the trash that other people leave behind or any other trash that you see and make sure it's disposed in the proper areas, you guys can help keep that pollution out of our creeks. Also, if you ever come to Portola, you can help pick up the trash and hold other camp campers accountable for any trash that you see that they leave behind. That way, our mathworm vertebrates, our fish, and even our crawdads can live happy, healthy lives. But as you guys may have remembered, those creeks, we're not the only ones that use our, those creeks. The mountain lions, our coyotes, our bobcats, and the birds here at Portola all depend on that water source because there's not a lot of fresh water left in the world. And we all share that with those animals. So not only is it important to keep our creeks safe for the animals that live in the creek, but it's important to keep those creeks clean and free of pollution for all of the other animals here at Portola. All of the plants, all of the bobcats, all the mountain lions, and all of the humans too. I love to go on my off time swimming and playing in the creeks. And it's so much fun to see campers swimming and playing in those creeks too. But we can only do that if we all help keep our creeks clean. So you guys are definitely able to do that. And I'm so excited to congratulate you all because you have made it through our entire Junior Ranger program. Congratulations, give yourselves a round of applause. But you're not a Junior Ranger yet until you've completed the Junior Ranger Pledge. So I want you all to raise your hand and repeat after me. I, state your name, promise to treat the earth and all living things with care and respect, to be thoughtful about what I do and how it affects others, and to learn about the importance of nature and our heritage. Congratulations, you guys. You have successfully earned another stamp in your guys' logbooks. I'm going to email you guys that stamp right after we're all done here and after I'm done putting away all of my critters. Our banana slug's on the floor. He's already leaving. That's okay. He's doing great. <laughs> and hopefully you guys are able to earn multiple badges and you can earn some real prizes like my cool Junior Ranger badge and then we can match and be good pals and it'll be awesome. I hope you guys have a great day and that you guys have a lot of fun and clean up that trash. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to stick around for just a couple more minutes. And you guys can ask me any questions that you'd like. So ask away. Let's see. Do we have any questions yet? <laughs> we are lucky that we have dragonflies here. All right. 
Oh, thanks. I loved having you at this Junior Ranger program. It was so cool to get to talk to you guys. Oh, and there's more Junior Ranger programs. So make sure you tune in either tomorrow and next Sunday. I'll be back again. You guys can hang out with me again. We do have a lot of butterflies. Banana slugs can get about 10 inches big at their biggest, but I've definitely seen ones that are bigger. You can help, but one other way that you're able to help keep your creek safe, not only by picking up pollution, but also telling other people. If you're able to tell other people about the cool things that you find here in the creeks, then they also can care more about it to keep the creeks more safe. So awareness is a huge part of keeping creeks safe. And don't worry, if you join this Junior Ranger program late, I'm gonna email the stamp to you guys after the program is over. So I'm gonna email the stamp later today. All right. You guys can catch crawdads because remember they're an invasive species and they're really not good for our creek. So you guys cannot fish in our creeks, don't catch any fishes, but you guys are welcome to catch some crawdads just as long as you don't transport them to other places. We don't want other places to have the same crawdad issue that we have here at Portola. This guy's smelly. Mm, I'm gonna put him down. Mm. All right, that looks like all of our questions. Thank you guys so much for joining and I'll see you guys again next Sunday at 10 o'clock. Bye everybody.